welcome to the Master's Touch Evensong service. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord. come expecting to receive tonight? Well, if not, you won't receive anything from the Lord. Elevate your expectation level and open your hearts to receive Him. Now, even song is primarily done through song, and the songs contain or point to the message. And under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we're bringing you our even song service tonight. We pray that you enjoy it and will join us often. As we begin our worship tonight, take a second to assemble a small piece of bread or a cracker, a swallow of some sort of beverage or juice. It could be water, and, and your, it could be any kind of food. It's the bite of it. Set it aside. Later on, we're going to pray over it, sanctifying it as the body and the blood of Christ. Right now, let's worship our King.
sing from our hearts that comes an anthem oh hear the heavens ring this is our song a song to our king let the worshipers arise
text today is Luke 5 verses 12 through 13. And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who, seeing Jesus, fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will, be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Sounds like so. what so many people believe in God's will right now. They, they believe that that's God's will. If it's your will, Lord, I will be healed. Now, the word tells us <clears throat> that immediately the leprosy left the man. So there was power in that word, right? Jesus said, I will. And faith came up in the man, and he knew, that man knew in his knower that it was Jesus' will. So there was no question in the man, and he was healed instantly. So what's God saying to you right now? Is he saying, I will? to you? You know, it never said in the Bible that Jesus said, not now, or it's not my will, or no, no, not now, maybe later. Let me tell you something. If you can't find it in the Bible, you can't live by it. There are many other scriptures confirming God's will that we are healed right now, today, and that it is God's will for all to be healed. And all of them are in the Bible. In our RRTT program, it's our Rapid Response Teaching Team program, I have made a printed booklet of those scriptures and even categorized them for easy usage because it's a, well, that book is about, it's a pamphlet, really. It's about a half inch thick, maybe a quarter to half an inch, somewhere in there. And why did I do that? Well, I'll tell you. I did it so that it would be easy for the recipient to get into that word and to know that it's God's will for them to be healed without having to rifle through the Bible for healing scriptures that I have no idea where to look and that's the reason most won't look up the scriptures. They'll just lie there and die first because most don't even know how to begin looking up uh, the, those scriptures, let alone where, you know, because they've never been taught. Now, you see, that kind of thing isn't taught in Sunday school or from the pulpit. And that's a real shame, folks. In the very beginning of faith, we find the fact that it's God's will for all of us to be healed. And it was established in the will of God. And we find that healing wholeness in the will uh, that that healing and wholeness will in God's word. That's where we find it. God's word is medicine. That's what it tells us. The word tells us a strong spirit will sustain you. Right at the, at the original creation, God let us know that it was his will that we be healed and whole and well. How did he do it? Well, he created Adam and Eve to have perfect glorified bodies that healed themselves. We have those same bodies. However, now they're no longer glorified thanks to Adam and Eve. But we know that it, it's God's will in heaven is healing and wholeness because there's no sickness in heaven, no decay, nothing, no thing, no death, except wholeness and wellness, perfection. Well then, what's the origin of sickness? Hmm, good question. Sickness is a work of the devil. God established the covenant with us, and it's a covenant of healing. We see that in the eternal names of God, to mention just a couple, Jehovah Rapha, my God that heals, and Jehovah Jireh, um, or Hira, my God that sees the need and supplies. So we see that sickness is a curse. Don't you agree? Now understand this. There are actually types of redemption, my friends. That's right. The premise is this. If we can find healing in the, in the type, then there's healing in what there was a type of. For example, I knew you were waiting for me to give you an example. <laughs> healing is a part of redemption. It belongs to you equally with forgiveness of all sin. 
Here's our proof. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in Him, Jesus, are yes and amen. How many of, uh, of the promises of God? All. There is no blessing available to mankind except through Jesus. That's an all-inclusive statement. And what do I mean? Well, I mean that God doesn't do things any other way. To do so would be unjust. You see, God is the righteous judge of all the earth, and he is known for all his righteous justice. So the only way that he would have a right to do something for a man or a woman is through Jesus, because he is the justifier. Now, if anyone ever got healed, it was based on what Jesus was going to do or what he has already done. We who are born again and living now are looking back to the cross and what it has done and what Jesus did there. Isaiah 52, by his stripes we were uh, says that by his stripes we are healed. Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet, and so prophecy then was just, well, it was before Jesus. First Peter says by his stripes we were healed after Jesus. So then everyone who ever got healed in the Old Testament, their healing was based on what Jesus was going to do. And Peter was on the same side we're on after the cross, after Jesus. All were healed based on what Jesus did at the cross. You know, all the promises of God can be found in God's ability to say, yes, you can have it through Jesus. Jesus is our hero, our everything. Jesus is it. He's all in all, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, and he's everything in between. There is no salvation apart from Jesus. He's the way, no blessing, no freedom, except through Jesus. So, if he, did buy, if he did buy and pay for our healing in his work of redemption, how many people does uh, redemption then belong to? All. Well, if that's true, then you can't say it's God's will for some to be born again and not for others. It belongs to whosoever. Whosoever will believe. Forever. So it's for whosoever or all who will believe. In Isaiah 53, uh, chapter 53, verse 1, the Bible says, Who has believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? All right, the answer to the last part is the answer to the first part. It's the ones who believe in the Lord. So let's take a look now at Jesus. You know, there's all kinds of romantic notions about Jesus. People portray him as acting as the Son of God. But the Word tells us there was no beauty in him. People met him on the street and never recognized him. He was ordinary looking. This is what the Word says, Isaiah 53, 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now the cross, to us, is holy, but not in that day. Today, people wear crosses hanging around their necks on their lapels. They display crosses on themselves or hanging from their mirrors in their cars. And in that day, wearing the cross would have been like uh, wearing an electric chair or the hypodermic needle of a lethal injection on your necklace, around your neck, or on your lapel. Crucifixion was the most gruesome death reserved for the most horrible criminals. It says in the Bible that cursed is any man who hangs on a tree. So everyone assumed that if a man died that kind of a death, he was accursed of God. And that's exactly what the masses believed. A lot were on the fence about Jesus. Some thought he was good and some thought he was bad. But when he was hung on that cross, the masses said, well, there you have it. He is accursed of God. I know, we don't like to hear that, but that's the truth, folks. Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The word is building up to the next verses that deal with our healing. And these words in the Hebrew were translated grief, and they are the same as sickness. The Young's translation of verse 3 says, He was a man of pains and acquainted with sickness. Surely his sickness, sicknesses he uh, has borne and his pain he has carried for us. Now, why am I talking about this? Well, because we know he bore our sin, but we lack understanding of how he bore our sickness and carried our pain when he carried our punishment. You see, that's what he did. He took all of our punishment. Now, my students have heard it explained to them, but most born-again believers haven't. Now, keep in mind, they get some sort of a semblance. They get a little smattering here and there, but they never get it put together like a puzzle so that you see the whole. Keep in mind that Isaiah is in the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has come upon him, and he's seeing into the future. He sees this and writes, and he sees it. Uh, he sees one who came, and he starts out with who believes this report. He's coming. He won't stand out in a crowd. There is no marvelous beauty in him. He's not great and handsome, and that, uh, and he's not so wonderful that he'll make you goo and ga over him. Oh no, actually, he'll be despised and hated by everybody, but. He is bearing our sicknesses and our pain, and the chastisement of our peace is upon him. So what is this? 
This is the great exchange, my friends. Look, we have uh, a we have to know that the word atonement is not a New Testament word. All right, it's an Old Testament word. It means to um, to cover. All right, and so Jesus didn't cover our sins. What did he do? He put them away once and for all. That's what the Bible says. We don't have the covering. We are free from it. We are remiss from sins, free from it. It's gone, eradicated. No one can find it. It is removed. Jesus took it on himself and took it away. During those three days and nights, he took it into the abyss. Now, you may already know this, but in many circles, it hasn't been taught that he took our sin and our sickness. He took our sickness. We're still in Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he has borne our griefs. Griefs is the Hebrew word koli. There are 20 times in the Old Testament that griefs was translated as sickness or disease. So here I need to tell you this story, and it's a true story. There was a group of Hebrew and Greek scholars that came together to translate the scriptures, and one said this word griefs has been translated consistently as sickness and disease. The other, uh, one of the other ones then reminded the group that that particular translation of griefs, griefs was not what the King James Version says, but one of them said, well, if we put sickness in the translation, it will play into the way the divine healing folks believe and teach. And if we do that, I'll quit the group. Now, this was a tight-knit group, folks, and as a result, it was translated griefs and solace with a footnote. Regardless, many, many times it's translated sickness or disease, and he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Whoa! You better stay away from that. It could impact you with lasting effects for the rest of your life, and I'm sure it will. Now, surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. That is what this literally means. If you don't know Hebrew or Greek, then in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit will confirm this. The Holy Spirit inspired Isaiah to say this. He quoted this in Matthew 8, verses 16 and 17. When even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. That it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. So all were healed in verse 17. So let me ask you this. Is healing for everyone? Yes. Redemption for everyone? Yeah. Jesus healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled what was said by, the, by Isaiah the prophet. So if the Holy Spirit said that, and that is what he said through Isaiah the prophet, then that must be what he said. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Now, when you come to believe that Jesus bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases just as strongly as you believe that Jesus took your sins, then you'll be healed. But wait a minute. Mm, surely he bore this so that we can bear sickness for his glory. No. Well then, why did he do it? So that we can be totally free from it. Why did he bear sickness and disease? So we can be free from it. Back to Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne my sicknesses and carried my pains. Yet it says, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. At the, and at this point, you have to hear with your heart now over the next few verses. How is it that we are healed? By his stripes. Stripes are the result of a beating. Isn't that right? Now the word stripes in the Old Testament and New Testament is tr translated a wound or a bruise, a welt, like when you're struck with a rod. In fact, the word rod is frequently used in the Bible in connection with the word stripe. Well, what are beatings? Beatings are punishment for breaking God's laws. In the Old Testament, they were given instructions about this in Deuteronomy 25, verses 2 through 3. This is what it says. And it shall be, if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before, meaning in front of, uh, his face, according to his fault, his crime, by a certain number. Forty stripes he may give him, and not to exceed, lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes, then my brother, the man being beaten, uh, should seem vile unto thee. All right, beaten. You're not beaten because you did well. You're beaten because you were disobedient. You're not beaten because you obeyed. The word says a rod is for the back of him that's void of understanding. Proverbs 10:13 tells us in the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. But a rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding. Proverbs 19:29 says judgments are prepared for scorners and stripes for the backs of fools. So stripes are for the backs of fools. Now, why would they need a beating? because they had listened to rebellious talk, and perhaps they were still rebellious after hours of pleading and dealing with them. We see that on television every day on these reality cop shows. So they were beaten as a punishment. 
punishment for their crimes, scourging. Now, Roman scourging and Jewish scourging are different. In the movie, The Passion of the Christ, the movie showed lots and lots of blood from Jesus' scourging. Now, we need to be cautious here and not lose focus. The Bible didn't, so we mustn't lose focus either. The word says, by his blood we are healed. No. What does it say? It says, by his stripes we are healed. Jesus was tied to the whipping post, and he was beaten. Now, there's all kinds of debates on the instruments used to beat him, but keep focus here. He was beaten. He didn't have to take a beating to go to the cross. He could have gone without doing that. Lots of those that were scourged died. So why did he do it? For our sins? No. The Bible says for our sicknesses and diseases to heal us. The result of him being beaten is for is you being healed. All right. So he got beaten. You got healed. Proverbs 20, verse 30 says, The blueness of a wound cleanses away evil, so do stripes the inward parts of the belly. In fact, 1 Peter 2 has that same meaning, bruise, like being struck with an object or a rod or a rock. The blueness of, a wo of the wound cleanses away evil. There's an interesting older colloquial colloquialism <laughs> regarding a child acting pouty. All they need is a good dose of strap oil. That's the colloquialism. Well, just what does that mean? They need a spanking. The Bible tells us as well that if we spare the rod, we will spoil the child. Now, that doesn't mean go out and beat your children with a strap or a stick or a, a tree limb. or Don't beat your children, but discipline them. That's what that means. So we see healing and beating, beating and bruises and healing. How do they all go together? Simple. Sickness is punishment. Sickness is punishment for breaking God's laws, for rebellion and disobedience. Stay with me here. Don't begin to judge. Keep those minds open. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. These are the laws of God, his rules and regulations to live by, and it tells us that, there that part of the penalty for breaking God's laws is being sick and diseased. That's why it's a perversion for a preacher to embrace sickness as some kind of blessing in disguise. Have you heard that from the pulpit? I have. Sickness is punishment, my friends. Poverty is punishment. Hell is punishment. Grief and vexation of mind and soul are punishment. Well, wait, was Jesus being punished? No, he was never sick. He had all he needed. Did he ever have a broken peace and depression? No, he lived in the blessing, not the curse. Because he was obedient, not disobedient. But here, the prophet is seeing him smitten and, and punished and scourged in Isaiah 53, verse 4. All the translations tell us that he carried our sicknesses and our disease and griefs and our suffering he endured. I want you to pay close attention right here. The Knox translation says he was smitten by God, punished by God. Punished by God is how we looked at him. Why would a person be punished by God? For breaking God's laws and being rebellious. Now, by the result of his beating to us, there's healing. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. The punishment for all of your mistakes and failures would have been broken fellowship with God. Your sins staying on you, broken peace, no confidence, having to go to hell when you die, and includes being sick and broken and defeated in this life. How many have sinned and come short of the glory of God? All. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the punishment involves all these things, and that's justice, and it ought to be that way, unless someone else will take your place for you and pay that price for you. God is the righteous judge of all, and you know what? He set it up so that someone else could take our place and pay the price for us. Jesus took our place, and he took all the punishment for all the sin and broken covenant, which included sickness. He took it, and he paid the price and took it specifically when he was tied to that post and was being beaten. People could see the soldiers beating him, but what they couldn't see were the spiritual blows. When Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane sweat drops of blood, was he recoiling then from the beating to come? If so, it said that some after him acted more, with more bravery. We don't like to hear that, but we need our eyes open, folks. Jesus was seeing more than that in Gethsemane. He saw what was going to happen to him in the spirit. Now, it didn't happen in his spirit. It was the spirit realm. Okay. While that was happening to his body in the natural, something else much, much worse was happening to him in the spirit realm, to his body, spiritual body. So go to Isaiah 53.10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, God, hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. By his bruise we are healed. Was it the bruises that the Romans put on him? No. The Lord bruised him. Who bruised him? 
the Lord. It says that it pleased the Lord. Well, how could it please the Lord to bruise him? Because he who knows the end from the beginning could see your face, and he could see my face. Well, yeah, but he was bearing our sins. Yes, but not in this verse. This verse says sicknesses and carrying our pains. This hasn't been taught. It's been alluded to, referred to, talked around, walked around, but not preached or taught from the pulpit. Repeat this. Surely he took my sicknesses, he carried my pains. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief. Uh-oh, the same word the translators had failing heart over and wouldn't put into the Bible. It's sickness. It's the very same word. Young's literal translation says Jehovah has delighted to bruise him. He has made him sick. Another translation says it pleased the Lord to crush him with disease. Who did it? The Lord. Being beaten was awful. Being nailed to a cross is incomprehensible, but that wasn't the half of it. That was just a small part of what happened to him. What made him sweat drops of blood in Gethsemane? I mean, what made him ask God to let this cup pass? Now understand this, Jesus isn't weak. Oh no, my friends. Jesus is strong, and yet he fell on the ground, overcome with all the pressure of it. Why? Because in a few hours he would hang on the cross, and all the ugliness of evil, all the vileness of iniquity, and the sins of all of mankind, from Adam all the way, and through, and down to, and through the future, right down to the last man on earth, will converge on him. Listen, he isn't going to just empathize with it. He's going to become it. Plus, in all of that, God will turn away from him. And that's why he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, the full judgment of God has come upon him. But before he went to the cross, he was tied to the scourging post, beaten senseless like a criminal. And the Bible says that Isaiah, seeing it in the spirit centuries before it happened, said what? God is bruising him. God is beating him. Look, as the soldiers hit him, it caused bruises and wounds, and at that very same time, with each blow, God struck him with the spiritual root of every sickness and disease that mankind will ever know. So when the Romans were beating him from the hand of the judgment of God came blows hitting his body from the inside out as well. There is a spiritual root that causes sickness and disease. All things have a spiritual root. Now faith is the substance that, is, that the invisible is really the visible to us. Well, God laid that spiritual reality on Jesus when the Romans beat him physically. Okay, follow closely here, because I'm going to show you the lie. The devil says God can heal and he loves you and all that, but you messed up. You missed God and his plan for your life. You feel so bad you grieve at the thought that is exactly why Jesus was beaten. That beating he took makes it a lie. If you messed up, you deserve to be punished, but Jesus took that for you. So why should you have to pay for it again? After all, that's why Jesus is at the whipping post, taking your physical and spiritual beatings for you. Those beatings are sickness and disease. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. <laughs> Jesus deserved no punishment, but we did, and we do. Well, if he took it from me, then do I have to have it anyway? Now, it's obvious. You know, in some countries, there still are laws that if you break one, they will tie you up right in the center of the city and beat you with a stick or cane you for punishment. So for an example of the point I'm making, let's say you and I were going on vacation in another country and you broke one of their laws and they were going to beat you and maybe you would even die from that beating. And I said, wait, 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 wait. Can I take their place? And they said, yes, that is accepted under our law here in our country. Okay, I went in your place and took the beating, and it was so bad that it took me three weeks to get over it enough to be able to get out of bed and walk again. And yet they come to your house right after they beat me. And they say, come on, we have to come, we've come to get you, you're going to be beaten. You broke the law, you deserve it. What would you say? Well, you better say, no, Stephanie took my beating. Now, if you let them beat you anyway, then why did I do it? What good did it do for me to take that beating if you let them beat you anyway? And by Jesus' beating, then we are free from the punishment. Are you understanding this? By his beating, then legally we are free from having to be punished. What did I say? I said the word is legally. Legally free from punishment because he took the punishment for us. Now I'm going to close with this. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. 
He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, it means silent, so he openeth not his mouth. All right, now let's look at our scenario again. I let them beat me so that they wouldn't beat you. Now they come to your house to beat you, and you don't open your mouth. You don't speak up. What's going to happen? You're going to get a beating. Why? Because... <laughs> because you didn't open your mouth. Did you have to get beaten? Well, you say, well, I learned something from it. Uh, well, you weren't supposed to. If I took the beating for you and you kept silent and took the beating too, then I did it in vain for no reason. And this is the gospel, my friends. What do we see? It's substitution. Redemption is exchange. Do you know why you're not going to hell? Because Jesus did it for you. Do you know why you don't have to be sick? Because he took sickness and disease for you. He took the beating for you. Acts 22. And I want you to understand something. When he was hanging on that cross, he didn't just say, okay, here's measles, I'll take them. Here's polio, I'll take that. And, and just gather it up in a big sack or something. No. He became that disease. It overcame him and he had the worst case of it ever known to man. Or that man would ever know. Okay, Acts 22, get ready to shout. And I do mean shout. There are things Jesus did as our example, but what he did as our substitute is different. They're not examples. He actually did these things as our substitute in our place. Okay. Here they tied the man of God to the scourging post, just as they did with Jesus. Actually, it hadn't been that long after they had crucified Jesus. And as they're tying him to the post, he says, oh, he opens his mouth. Get the picture. They're tying him up. They took off his coat, tied him up to the post. He can hear that guy warming up his whip back there behind him. And he says, hey, hey. And the guy with the whip yells at him, shut up. You're about to be beaten. And the man said, well, hey, is it legal to beat a Roman citizen that hasn't been found guilty and convicted of a crime? I mean, is it legal? Now, he knew it wasn't legal, and they knew it wasn't legal. But here's the thing. He opened up his mouth. Don't you know he was glad he knew about his rights? You see, in those days, if you weren't a Roman, you were no one. You were nothing. It didn't matter who you were, what you had. Non-citizens could be beaten and made slaves, but not Roman citizens. If they found your dead body along the side of the road and you weren't a citizen, they'd just roll you over into the ditch and leave you there to rot. They wouldn't even open up an investigation. But if you were a Roman citizen, you were someone and you had rights. You had rights that the whole kingdom and emperor himself backed up personally. You had rights. You could appeal your case all the way up to Caesar, and Paul did. It's a matter of Bible record. He stood before Agrippa, and he said, I appeal to Caesar. Why? Because he had rights. Why is this in the Bible? The Bible says in Philippians that our citizenship, the Greek word palatichuma, our citizenship is in heaven. So uh, what do you think that means? It means that your name is written in a book. And I'm telling you, in eternity, if you aren't a citizen of heaven, no matter who your family is, how much money they had or you had, how important they were or you think you are, there is only one roster that matters. And if your name isn't in that book, if you are not a citizen of heaven, nothing, my friend, nothing else matters. But here's the good news. If your name is in that book, then you have heavenly citizenship and you have rights and you have those rights right now. Most Christians don't know this. They're silent because, uh, and they are taking the beatings and they're taking it, uh, the stealing of their finances and the sickness that tries to come on them and their children. They take it and they take it and they take it. The devil is stealing from them and he's beating them and they're taking it. Why? Because they don't know they have any rights. So they don't stand up or speak up for themselves. Let me ask you something. What if Paul had been quiet? I mean, what if he'd sat there and said, well, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes and I guess I do deserve a good beating. Lord, help me be strong. Help me take this like a man. Well, if that's all you know, then the Lord will give you strength, my friends. But there is something better. Now, what did Paul say? Wait a minute. The guy is warming up the whip, and Paul did what? Opened up his mouth and said, wait a minute. That guy is cracking that whip, anxious to get on with the program, just waiting for somebody to whip and torture. He's going to flay him. He's going to flay you. So what do you say? Hey, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. Let me tell you what you say. You tell that devil this. It is isn't lawful. Now the devil doesn't want you to know this. This He's a spiritual outlaw. He wants you to, uh, he, to be taken advantage of. And actually he wants to do it. He wants to take advantage of your ignorance. He wants you to be quiet and take it. And Paul says, is it lawful for you to whip a Roman citizen? He knew who he was. He knew he had rights. Now when the centurion heard that, he went and stopped the whole thing. The whole low-level devil comes to you. And what do you do? 
You speak up. You tell him, no, not in my house. No, no, you don't. You tell him, it isn't legal for you to touch me. Listen, my friends, you are born into the citizenship of the heavens when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Your name, at that twinkling of an eye, is written in that book. And that book is the book of the redeemed, a roster of the citizenship of the eternal kingdom of God. Now, as a citizen of heaven, you have rights, you have rights, and you must know them and speak them out. Jesus didn't open his mouth. If he had, legions of angels would have saved him. You know, he could have. When they tied him to the post and beat him, he could have said, wait a minute, I appeal to justice. I don't deserve this. I appeal to God Almighty. If he had, guess what? He would have been saved and we would have to pay the penalty for our sin. But he didn't. All he had to do was open his mouth and speak, but he didn't. He was silent. He opened not his mouth. He took it. Do you know why he opened not his mouth? So that we could open up our mouths. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Open up your mouths and say when anything negative comes and begins to pound on you. Don't keep silent. Open up your mouth and say it isn't legal. Tell the devil it's not legal for you to touch me. I am a citizen of heaven. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. You speak up and guess what? The enemy will flee. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Praise God for our rights and heavenly citizenship. Praise God that Jesus is alive. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Friends, right now, if you desire to come into the kingdom of God and dwell in the miraculous presence of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, if you desire to be in Christ and avail yourself of his marvelous wisdom and power, you must give your life to him. It's very simple and it's pain-free. And in just a moment, I'm going to give you that opportunity.
this manger king, my everything. Love came for me. like to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, sincerely repent from all of your sins, acknowledge and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and offer up this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner and surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me and set me free for all eternity from all my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead and sit at the right hand of God the Father. Take over my life and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I renounce the devil and all sin. Lord, I receive from you the gift of righteousness, total forgiveness of all my sins, past, present, and future, divine health, wholeness, and restoration, your protection, direction, your provision, your peace, and the gift of everlasting life. I'm yours. Come into my heart. Take over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, then you're saved. Welcome to the family of God. Rejoice. Behold the Lamb I will worship
the wonderful things that we receive from taking Holy Communion is healing of our bodies and minds. And the issue with those who take Holy Communion and don't receive their healing through it, it's rooted in lack of knowledge. Now we must prepare before taking Holy Communion and the first thing that we do is discern the body of Christ. What does that mean? Well, by acknowledging that the bread or whatever you're using as the body of Christ is the vibrancy of the life of Jesus, His supernatural healing and wholeness, that because of His body and blood you supernaturally have become bone of Jesus' bone and flesh of Jesus' flesh, that you are now filled with His perfection and power, completely healed, completely made whole, completely restored to divine health. You can think of it uh, as a pill that's glowing with the Shekinah glory of God. It's healing you as it travels through your mouth and down into your body. And it's pushing out all darkness, which is sickness and disease, from the inside out. Now, visualize the condition you're plagued with. The sickness or disease being on Jesus' body. You put whatever the ailments are on him. Use your imagination. You're not giving him something he doesn't want. He already took it at the cross, remember? You see, the enemy's trying to trick you. He's trying to trick you into taking it. How? By deceiving you into thinking that you've got it through lying symptoms. But since Jesus took it already at the cross, you are already healed and made whole. So, put those lying symptoms back on Jesus, right in the same place on him that you've been afflicted. In other words, see yourself with the solution. See yourself without the problem. This is called spiritual visualization. It's vital that you understand this and do it. Now, before we go on to the next thing that we do, I want you to understand something. What I'm talking about here is when you put the lying symptoms back on Jesus is this. You know that he took everything. I just told you this in our service and in the Bible I gave you scriptures to back it up. That he took all sickness, all disease in his body on the cross. He took it and he took it then so that we wouldn't have to have it. He took it out of this world completely. So you can see then that any time you get sick or you have a sick symptom on uh, come on you, that's a lying symptom. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus already took it, so it's not yours. It isn't even here. But the enemy is deceiving you, so you put it back on him. Okay, you give it back to Jesus, right, right, in, right where he he uh, uh, had it, where you're afflicted. Okay. Now we next thing we do is discern the blood of Christ. We don't usually have any trouble discerning the blood. We discern it as the forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future. We would discern it as restoration of the blessing to your life, the power and the authority of God in your life in full operation. Hallelujah. You would discern it as receiving God's provision and protection, as receiving the gift of righteousness from Jesus Christ, thanking God for his plan of redemption and that you've been included, <laughs> and that you've been given eternal life, life everlasting. And now you no longer live under the law, but you live under his grace. As born-again believers, my friends, we have Jesus' bones and we have his flesh, and through Holy Communion, we have his blood. We are complete. Hallelujah. Now, lift up the elements of the covenant before the Lord that I asked you to assemble at the beginning of the program. And I'm going to pray over them. Okay? Father, we praise you and worship you with these elements of the covenant. We thank you that your only begotten son, Jesus, gave his life sacrificially so that we may live and have life more abundantly. We thank you now as this bread becomes our portion of his healing body and the vibrancy of his life within us. We thank you that as we partake of the body of Christ, we become healed and made whole, completely restored. We thank you that this beverage becomes our portion of his cleansing blood, that we are continually washed in the blood and renewed within as we perpetually remember his act of love on the cross on our behalf. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus our Christ, amen. Now the Lord's Supper is a personal fellowship, my friends. It's a partnership with Christ. Partaking of one bread creates partnership between the members, the disciples as well. It merges us all into one body, and that's known as the church. The Word of God commands us to eat the bread and drink the cup. Continually take bread, break it and eat it, and then give and give thanks, okay? Uh, and then take the cup, give thanks and drink it, all of it, all both things in remembrance of Jesus. And you know, the Lord commanded that the supper be repeated often. However, Paul doesn't give us instruction as to how frequently the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated, and yet he does imply that it's to be done with frequency. Why? So that partaking of the Lord's Supper will continually recall to our mind our redemption by Christ from all sickness, all disease, and all sin. So do it as often as you want to and need to. As we are instructed, we discern the body and the blood of Christ as we prepare to partake. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Father, we thank you that this bread has become the healing body of our Lord Jesus the Christ. The body of our Lord Jesus, broken for you so that every cell, tissue, organ, and bone, all systems, neurological, blood vascular, lymphatic, muscular, skeletal, all of them, are totally aligned with God's word and his will, that you are and remain healed, made whole, and totally restored to divine health and wholeness. In the name of Jesus, our healer, the Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the body of our Lord and Savior. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you that this beverage has become the precious saving blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. The blood of our Lord Jesus shed for you in celebration of the finished work of Jesus on the cross for the remission of all of your sins, past, present, and future. In the name of Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior the Christ, we pray. Amen. Partake of the blood of our Lord and Savior. You know, the Lord's Supper is a feast. It's a feast in union with the living believers and the Savior, whereby we spiritually and by faith receive Christ with all of his benefits, and we are nourished with the vibrancy of his life into eternal life. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Amen. Now raise your hands for the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. May you open up your mouth and continually declare who you are in Christ Jesus, taking and giving thanks to God for all that you've received and give honor and glory and praise to the Lord Most High. May the Lord continually bless you with divine health and wholeness and make your way prosperous as you walk in his love. In the name and the majesty of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you, my friends. Join Dr. Stephanie every Sunday at 7 p.m. here on Spreaker.com for Evensong Worship. Evensong Service is an extension of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International, a 501c3 organization.